Presence Lutheran Church. I'm Pastor Miles Hopgood, and it is a delight to be with you today as we gather for worship on this Palm Sunday. The first portion of our worship was held outdoors here at the church. That was the Liturgy of the Palms. We are now beginning together here online the Liturgy of the Passion. Please, as you are able, rise in body or spirit. contemplation of the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ and meditate on the salvation of the world through his sufferings, death, burial, and resurrection. Let us pray. Everlasting God, 
In your endless love for the human race, you sent our Lord Jesus Christ to take on our nature and to suffer death on the cross. In your mercy, enable us to share in his obedience to your will and in the glorious victory of his resurrection, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The first lesson is from Isaiah 50, verses 4 to 9a. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher, that I may know how to sustain the weary with the word. Morning by morning he wakens, wakens my ears to listen as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I am not rebellious. I did not turn backward. I, have, I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face in flint, and I like, I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let them stand up together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me. Who will declare me guilty? The word of the Lord. Our psalm for today is from Psalm number 31, which we will read responsively by the whole verse. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am in trouble. My eyes consumed with sorrow, and also my throat and my belly. I am the scorn of all my enemies, a disgrace to my neighbors, a dismay to my acquaintances. When they see me in the street, they avoid me. For I have heard the whispering of the crowd, fear is all around. They put their heads together against me, they plot to take my life. My times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Our second lesson is from the book of Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The word of the Lord. This is the moment when I would like to invite all of our younger members to sit up straight, scooch a little bit forward on the couch, because the message that follows is especially for you. 
We're doing things a little out of order today, but I promise you it is for a good reason. In a moment, we are going to hear a very long reading from the Gospel of Mark, all about Jesus' passion, which is the word we use to refer to his death on the cross and all the suffering that led up to it. There's going to be a lot to that story. You're going to hear different things about Jesus' trial, about his punishment by the Roman Empire, all the people who mocked him, made fun of him, treated him poorly, about how he died on the cross and was buried. There will be so much there, and it's okay if you feel lost or lose your place. One of the amazing things about worshiping online is you can pause things, go back and rewatch them if you need to. And I invite you to do that, to really listen to this story. Even when you do that, though, there is so much to hold on to. It's hard to find a thread. And that's what I wanted to give to you, something to hold on to as you listen to this story and think about all that happens there. It's going to be a lot to take in, to see all the terrible things people did and said to Jesus. What I want you to remember as you listen to all of it is that every one of these people is someone that Jesus loves dearly, loved them then, loves them now, loves them always, and that all of them, the Roman governor Pontius Pilate, who refused to do the right thing even though he knew what he was doing was wrong, he did it anyway. All the leaders who knew Jesus was innocent but punished him anyway because they didn't like what he said. All the people who were hurt and mocked Jesus because when they were hurt, they just wanted to hurt someone else. All of these people, Jesus loved them just as much as Jesus loves you and me. Jesus took up the cross for them, suffered all of this because he loved them so much. There's no one in this story that Jesus does not love. There is no one in this story that Jesus does not want to spend eternity with in heaven just as much as with you and me. That is what makes God so remarkable, that God loves everyone even those who put God on the cross. And that's good news for you and me today too, dear friends. There's nothing you can do, however wrong, that will stop God loving you. God is always there with so much love, wanting to draw you back to see you hear and know of that love and to share in the new life where we don't treat people the way Jesus is treated here but treat them and love them just the way that God would have us. So listen carefully to this story, dear friends. And even when it gets upsetting or hard to listen to, remember how much God loves all of these people and how much we too are called to love each other, no matter how hard or difficult it can be. Thank you so much for joining me here for this moment. You can go back to your seats now and get ready to listen to the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and the scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him, You say so. 
Then the chief priests accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival, he used to release a prisoner for them, anyone for whom they asked. Now a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to his custom. Then he answered them, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priests had handed him over. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again, Then what do you wish me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, Crucify him. Pilate asked them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him! So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters. And they called together the whole cohort. And they clothed him in a purple cloak. And after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him. And they began saluting him, Hail, King of the Jews! They struck his head with a reed spat upon him, and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. They compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his clothes among them casting lots to decide what each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two bandits, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by him derided him, shaking their heads and saying, Ha ha, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests, along with the scribes, were also mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now, so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also taunted him. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, 
Listen, he is calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two, from top to bottom. Now when the centurion, who stood facing him, saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was God's son. There were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James the Younger, and of Joseph and Salome. They used to follow him and provide for him when he was in Galilee. And there were many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. When evening had come, and since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate wondered if he were already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he had been dead for some time. When he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. Then Joseph bought a linen cloth, and taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. He then rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where the body was laid. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Dear friends, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Reading through the Passion narrative together, it is so easy to find ourselves lost amid the myriad scenes. All around us are vignettes, humanity on full display. In any one of them, we could stop for a lifetime and look in on ourselves to see in the crowd, in the leaders, in the people, Pilate, the bandits flanking Jesus on his left and right. Look in on any of them and see ourselves. Those bits of us in our inner parts that we do not look at often for we do not like what we see there. Sights of jealousy, of bitterness, of spite. Sights of what we do to one another and our world. There is only one person in this story we can look on and hope to see something good. The centurion, the only one who there can look upon the crucified Christ and see that this truly was the Son of God. But even the centurion himself is a condemnation for us, for he is the most unlikely of all the characters we see. He is an oppressor, the foot soldier of a foreign army there in Palestine to extract the wealth of a conquered people, to subjugate them, to force them into submission. The manner of death is one of his people's own design. And yet it is he, and he alone, who sees what you and I are called to see 
who can proclaim in that moment the gospel truth that all else are blind to, that you and I are called to be witnesses of in our own day. What does it mean that alone the centurion sees the truth of this moment? What does it mean that only the oppressor in this foreign land can find what escapes every other eye? The centurion himself, though, is not so simple as this, and perhaps there we can find some insight. For though he is there as an oppressor to the people of this land, he himself is an oppressed person within the empire. Long gone are the days where the armies of Rome were populated by the noble sons of its higher born. No, by this late stage in the empire, the dictatorship already in full force. The soldiers of Rome, those sent out to the bidding to keep its imperial force at present across the world. They were not the high-born, the noble. No, they were the lowly and the outcast. Those conquered by Rome themselves, hoping for a better life in this empire in which they found themselves. Those low plebs, hoping for a chance of a better life or those without the protections of citizenship, hoping for the chance for some acknowledgement, some way of living that was better than what they came from. In this way, perhaps the centurion is the one who can see Jesus for who he is, because of all those there, he is the most conflicted, the one who is the victim of oppression forced by it to become an oppressor himself. This conflict within him is what looks out and sees Jesus on the cross, sees him dying there as an imagination of a way of living he did not believe for himself possible. A way out a breaking of the cycle of violence in which he has become fully complicit. And that is what swirls around Jesus throughout his passion today, the cycle of violence that all are bent on perpetrating. The crowd of people there in Jerusalem presented with the choice of whether to release Jesus or Barabbas, choosing Barabbas, an insurrectionist a revolutionary, one who had done violence against the Roman Empire that was oppressing them. They chose him instead. And when Pilate points out why condemn Jesus to death, he has done nothing wrong. He belays the point. That is exactly it. They want to release someone who has done wrong, someone who has done violence. They want more violence done. The hate, the pain they have received from empire they wish to do back to it. They despise Jesus, mock him for what they see as his weakness, his refusal to do violence back to the empire who has done violence to him, to come down from the cross and to wreak havoc on those who have wrecked havoc on them. All around Jesus swirls the cycle of violence. The people who cheered his entry into Jerusalem want that from him, and he will not give it to them. And that is why they consent to his dying on the cross. A death that Rome wishes for him just as much. For they too are invested in the cycle of violence. It will be the revolutions that are brought about that they use to justify their destruction of the temple, their further oppression of the people. No one is right. No one needs to be better or worse. It all falls to the side as violence begets violence. Only Jesus sees the other way, sees what it will ask of him and goes to it willingly takes up the cross, takes all the violence of the world, all its hatred, its enmity, its disgust at the other upon himself. Takes it up, 
out of love for the oppressed and out of love for the oppressor, that in his name and on the cross he bore, all oppression would cease. And this is what the centurion sees on the cross, the end of the oppression, a way out of this cycle in which he is trapped as oppressed and oppressor in one body, a way he himself could not imagine taking, but seeing it on the cross knows it to be possible. It is a life that will not be easy, that asks of him and each of us to take up our crosses also. But it is the only way of life, a way of humble self-emptying, not seeing any privilege that this world would offer us as worth having, but following in the footsteps of Christ, emptying ourselves out also that we might be filled with the love Christ has for us as a love we show to all people in places and times. A solidarity with the oppressed around us, a refusal to participate in their oppression, a love like that, filling every corner of our being, spilling out from us in all we say and do. That is the life we see on the cross, a life offered to each of us, a life opened to all of us. There is a reason that the Apostle Paul will always describe this life as a dying to ourselves and a rising to new life in Christ that it is no longer I who live, he says, but Christ who lives in me. For this is not a life, even though we are invited into it, that we are capable of living ourselves. It can only be among us as Christ lives in, with, and through us. As Christ resides in us, makes home in us, draws us, knits us together into his own body. And this week, as we move with Christ to this passion and await with hope for the empty tomb, may we each in our own way and time contemplate this life together. And not only contemplate it, but pray for it earnestly, that what was promised and worked in us in baptism may continue to this day the inhabiting of us by this love of Christ and all that it promises for our world. In our company, dear friends, may it be so. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue our worship this day by rising in body or spirit to sing our hymn of the day.
With the whole church, let us confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Prayers of the People Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the Church, the world, and all in need. The response this morning is, Your mercy is great. In Jesus you came among us as a suffering servant. Give your Church humility. Redeem your people from pride and the certainty that we always know your will. Heal us and empower us to confess Christ crucified. We pray for our bishops, Elizabeth and Tracy, for our mission partner, St. Bartholomew's, and for the other churches in the Trenton Area Partnership, Redeemer and Prince of Peace. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. In creation, life springs from death. Redeem your creation awaiting resurrection. Restore lost habitats and endangered species. Create new possibilities for areas affected by climate change. Grant relief from natural disasters and nurture new growth. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Jesus was handed over to the powers of this world. In all nations, instruct the powerful that they would not exploit their power but maintain justice. Sustain soldiers and guide those who command them, that they serve those in greatest need. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. On the cross, Jesus joined all who feel forsaken. Abide with those who are condemned to death. Defend those who are falsely accused. Console and strengthen those who are mocked or bullied. Accompany all who suffer, especially Barbara, Barbara Bertha, Hannah Lore, Amanda, B, Edna, Trish, Mia, Nancy, Jack, Jean, Danuta, Matt, Edward, Jean, Ellen and Warren, Bobby, Mark, Debbie, Tim, Carol, Beverly and Vic, Kathy, Anthony, Elise, Tom, Laura, Mary Ann, Adelaide, Lika, and Greg. Grant respite and renewal. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. You called followers to tend Jesus' body in death. Sustain hospice workers and funeral directors. Bless this congregation's ministries at times of death. Those who plan and lead funerals, those who prepare meals, all who offer support in grief. We pray especially for the family and friends of Edward Zabisky, Barbara Friedrich, and Marie Schwartz. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. You inspire the centurion to confess Jesus as your son. We praise you for the faith you have given to people of all places and times. Give us also such faith to trust the promises of baptism and with them to look for the resurrection of the dead. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. God, giver of life, you intend for humans to live together in peace. In this time of grief over gun violence, we pray for your presence among us. We remember before you those who have died in Atlanta and Boulder. We commend them to your eternal love. Grant healing and wholeness to their survivors who are wounded or traumatized, and restore all whose spirits are maimed by such violence. We ask your mercy on the ones who fired the weapon. With your grace, transform those who from malice or illness inflict violence on others. Console their families and make us instruments of your peace. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Please share a sign of peace with one another, either in person, in the chat box, comment section, or simply through the Spirit. Let us take a moment to prepare our offering this day.
Let us pray. O God of justice and love, we give thanks to you that you illumine our way through life with the words of your Son. Give us the light we need, awaken us to the needs of others, and at the end, bring all the world to your feast. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Once again, it has been a delight to worship with you this morning, and I have just a few announcements for the good of our lives together. This is a reminder that if the nature of today did not tip you off, we have begun Holy Week, the week of festivals and feasts and remembrances leading up to Easter Sunday. We are worshiping throughout this week in many and various ways, sometimes online, sometimes in person, most often both. For a complete rundown of all the different worship services, please see our website. But just to give you a quick recap, on Thursday, which is Maundy Thursday of this week, we will be worshiping online at 7 p.m. For Good Friday, we will be in person outdoors at 5 p.m., online at 7 p.m. For the Vigil of Easter on Saturday, outdoors at 5 p.m., online at 7 p.m. And then for Easter morning, we will be in person outdoors at 6.30 a.m. for a sunrise service and online at 10.45 a.m. Following Easter Sunday and for the Sundays after going forward, we will be worshiping in person outdoors at 9 a.m. and online at 10.45 a.m. And this will be our continual pattern until we decide it is time for a change. For this week, seeing as there is so much worshiping going on, our regular education activities are suspended. Keep an eye on Share and Prayer to see when they will resume. After Easter Sunday, starting the next day, Easter Monday, I will be on vacation for two weeks. Uh, we will still have those outdoor and online services on Sunday, however, so please continue to worship with us and join us there. If there are any other announcements that need to be shared for the good of our lives together, uh, take a look at the chat box. You can share them there or in the comments section. And if you want to make sure that I make an announcement, just get it to us as soon as possible so that we'll have it ready for time of recording. Now, as you are able, please rise in body or spirit to receive this blessing which comes from God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We continue our worship by singing our sending hymn.
godliness. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, comfort the afflicted, honor all people. Love and serve God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. Thank you.